What's going on guys? This is Pete Clark and welcome to another highly instructional poker video here at Carrot Corner Poker Education. In today's video, we're going to be going over a 25 NL session that I played. I'm going to show you guys how to crush the micro stakes, how to exploit these players for all of their leaks. But first off, let's meet the gang. Here we have Goat Gruffles, we have Ike, we have Mukaku, the black and white one, and over here we have the one and only Rex. They're currently enjoying a bit of kale. And yeah, this is Carrot HQ, guys. This is where I live. You can actually see behind me here, the Carrot HQ up there. That top window there is where the magic happens. And speaking of that, let's get into today's video and exploit some micro stakes players. Let's go. Pocket Potatoes here in the hijack. We go ahead and open, we get called by the big blind. Over here, we're going to open this ace eight offsuit. Like I said, it doesn't really, the rake is high, but that doesn't really stop us opening wide. It more affects big pots based on rake cap. So 984, you can bet or check this hand. It doesn't actually matter. Some people think that you have to bet here. I am going to bet here this time, but I don't actually have to do it. The reason I don't have to do it is that while I will gain some protection by betting, we do also gain some EV when we check back and get Villain to bluff later, or just control the pot size when Villain's actually doing really well here. This brings us to exploit number one. Micro stakes opponents are very bad at protecting their in-position checking range on the flop. While I was mixing some check there with pocket tens, you will not see your opponents do that very often, and therefore you should be over-aggressive with your turn probing strategy whenever flop goes check-check. This is another 3-bet sizing mistake from Villain here, going this small in the big blind doesn't really make sense if you're building the right shape of range, you should normally be building a bit of a polarised range here, which would indicate a bigger 3-bet sizing generally. I think Ace-Jack in these positions, hijack against big blind, is just going to be a pure call, it's a little bit too good to be folding. I do expect this range to be overly strong, because the sizing isn't quite right. I think it's quite likely that this is a recreational player, or possibly just a weaker regular. When they quickly check this flop, it could be that they're protecting their range adequately, but this hand is allowed to bet even if they are doing that, and it's certainly allowed to bet if they're not protecting their range, so I'm going to pure bet here. I think bet just has a higher EV than normal on this node. This is an interesting turn card where Villain does have a lot of combos of like overpair here, ace-queen with backdoor, something like this, possibly something like jacks, something like... Eight. I actually think fold equity on this node immediately is pretty low, and I think if we get jammed on here, it's a bit of a disaster. So this is a cool pattern that at this SPR with this much equity and just being jammed on being such a travesty, I think this is just an automatic check. Although we do have a lot going on, it's not the case that you just want to bet your range on the turn from the top down and just bet all the high equity hands before the low equity hands. This hand just suffers a lot from facing aggression on the turn from facing a reopening jam. And therefore, I like check back here. When Villain half pots the river, this range is going to be incredibly strong. It's already filtered on the flop. People are going to under bluff this spot severely. No, we don't have a bluff catcher in this situation. We're not calling anyway. But it's important to note that this spot is under bluffed. Let me talk a bit more about why the situation is so incredibly under bluffed and why you would not want to call any of your bluff catchers here at all. It's a very important point. Guys, watching a carrot poker school training video is like getting an elite academic education in cash game poker that you simply cannot get anywhere else. If studying poker was like studying, say, law for instance, then choosing the carrot poker school would be like getting into the top law school in the country. Imagine getting 33 lectures from such an establishment for less than a thousand pounds. Most poker players struggle because they simply lack the theory necessary to understand the mechanics of this complex game properly. They get disorganized, random content, and rely on the advice of peers in study groups and forums who are also struggling. The Carrot Poker School gives you all of the material you need to achieve your wildest poker dreams. The rest is up to you. To pick up the Carrot Poker School today, click the top link in the description, head on over to carrotcorner.com, Add it to your cart, go to checkout, make a payment, and you are done within 10 seconds. You can then download all of our videos and get ready to start your full scholarship. Let's get back to the action. What Villain has to do here is recognize what the bottom of their range is for calling flop, condensing, right? Squashing their range towards stuff that had a reason to hang around on the flop. They have to take the bottom of that condensed squashed range and actually turn it into a bluff here. The idea in this situation, theoretically, is that our range is folding an absolute ton, and therefore even though Villain could check a hand like pocket eights here and sometimes win, they're actually going to do better by bluffing that hand because their range is so strong and the fold equity they're meant to generate is just so damn high. So in this situation, 
we don't want to call hands that GTO would call. Like, GTO would probably get here with a hand like a queen. Let's say, like, queen jack or king queen or something like that. And we'd be like, hey, let's just peel. Because, you know, we have a bluff catcher and villain will be bluffing sometimes. He'll be turning 8-7 into a bluff. He'll be turning 8s into a bluff. He'll be turning 9-8 into a bluff. The thing is that your pool just isn't going to do that because they're not going to be aware of just how strong their range has become via the combination of filtering and condensing by calling your flop bet getting rid of their very worst stuff like Ace-King, no backdoor, and then the Queen coming on the turn just further strengthening their range and making it even harder for them to have air. Whenever your opponent has condensed their range and the board has run out in a way that makes it hard for them to have nothing, the spot is going to be dramatically underbluffed at these stakes. So if I got here with a hand like King-Queen, I would actually exploit Fold This River and be very happy with it. All right, so point number two. Whenever your opponent has A, condense their range, and B, the texture has made it difficult for a villain to still have any air hands, this spot is going to be very underbluffed, and you're going to want to overfold your range, folding all of your bluff catcher hands. So this spot is going to be... A mix of 4-bet and call, I think mostly just going to be calling in this situation. So when we face the C-bet, we're actually just going to play call only. If this wasn't a paired board, we can actually do a bit more raising. Like if it's something like Ace, 7, 6, where we have more sets, it's a little bit more polarizing for us and we don't have such a big nut disadvantage, we can definitely build a raising range. In this situation, we're not going to. On double flush draw, it is tempting to jam here because the denial that we get is quite useful. However, I don't think on this texture we play many jams even on double flush draw. I think we just call here. When Villain quickly checks the river, this is quite interesting. I do expect this spot to be overfolded. I really don't expect my opponent to ever snap check a hand that beats me here. So I actually think I have like 98% equity. When you have 98% equity, you just have to try to value bet. It's not ideal and you will get folds the vast majority of the time, but the thing is, you don't need to worry about how often you're getting called when you just always win. This is another thought process I see people suffer from, another leak that I think it's really important to go over. So let me pull up the replayer once more here. Villain very quickly checks this spot, which is indicative that they just don't have a hand that beats us. I'd be extremely surprised to see anybody at these stakes snap check even a hand like Pocket Aces, which probably has to check the turn all the time, come to think of it. But I'd be very shocked to see Villain check a hand like Aces, Queens, Pens, I mean, they're not really betting 10s on the turn anyway. A flush. I just don't think it's happening. King Jack, I just don't think it's happening with that with that speed. So here's the thought process that people get wrong a lot of the time. As a poker coach, you often hear your students say things like, I didn't think he would call with worse, or I didn't think he was often calling with worse would be a bit better, um, or he's just not going to call me would be the extreme, like too strong form of that, of that sentiment. The issue with that is that if you have 100% equity, I'm not saying we do, but hypothetically, if we had 100% equity, you can't lose. So when you value bet, if you get called 1% of the time, it's still worth jamming, right? Because you're going to pick up that money. You're not going to get raked on your jam. So even if you're you're getting called only 1% of the time, if you always win, you still want to value shove. Now, of course, we're not winning 100% of the time, but if our equity, like I said, is something like 95% here, you just have to stick it in and hope the villain just decides to call with ace-10, just decides to call with ace-king, something like that. If you don't try, you don't get, right? And in a spot where I'm very confident I'm never losing, I just go ahead and make a thin value shove and just hope for the best. Exploit number three, when people quickly check the river out of position, they are much more capped than they should be. You're winning more often than you should be in theory, and therefore you get to value bet thinner than GTO might recommend. It doesn't really matter how often you get called if you're never losing. Ace nine deuce. This is a board that you can go really small on. You can also check on. I'm just going to stick to my strategy of extremely small c betting. I think making your c bet smaller at these stakes is really cool. There's not really a downside to this. You can still facilitate the pot growth as and when you want to with the strong hands in your range by betting four big blinds on the flop. But what you're going to do is just cause villain a much trickier puzzle to solve. People are going to be inelastic quite a, quite a lot at 25 and L, which means that they don't react to the difference between third pot and fifth pot very well. And therefore, when you're bluffing or just betting a mediocre thin value hand, it's probably better just to go smaller. Exploit number four. Downsize your C-bets against recreational opponents at micro stakes. They're not going to react much differently to one third as they are with one fifth pot. So when you have a bluff or the bottom of your range or even just a mediocre thin value bet, there's no sense in going bigger than you need to. You'll get similar fold equity anyway and you'll cut the risk the times that things go badly for you. Sorry, I was just um, got some techno stuff on, so, you know, I'm just dancing. Just dancing, guys. All right, Ace-10 here. We're going to go ahead and mostly call this one. We do a little bit of three bet, though. It's totally fine. We're going to call this time and check it over. Let me know what you think about the dancing in the comments. 
do um, smash that like button if you like the dancing or if you like the video. Either is good. 1.52 BBs. Okay, we're just going to be building call only here. If we are against button, we can start raising the spot theoretically. I don't think it's actually good to raise this hand against pull because I think they're going to overfold against the flop check raise in most spots. So what that means is that we don't actually want to check raises then for value, but we do want to bluff more. That would be the exploit there. Number five, do not check raise as thinly for value as you see a solver do against your micro stakes opposition, but do bluff more. The fold equity on the flop is higher than it's supposed to be on average, which means a bluff heavy strategy is going to be the way forward. Against overbet, we have, I believe, another call, though our hand is getting pretty indifferent here. The 10 is actually not the best card because it does block some bluffs. I wonder if I'm already indifferent enough to mix fold here. I don't think so after facing one third. I think I have to call most a most a six here. The 10 is one of the worst ones, though, for sure. I wouldn't be shocked if I was allowed to fold this hand. Sometimes actually it is a bluff catcher. Yeah, I'm actually going to mix this and sometimes fold. I roll a call on this occasion. So when there are two flush draws here, and I think that what Pool is generally doing on the turn is building too much overbet around the flush draw region, and people do not like following through with busted flush draws on the river. Therefore, when we face a second overbet here, this is definitely going to be an under bluff spot. You want to go ahead and just fold all bluff catchers to 25 and L against this line because what's going to happen is that the flush draws that mess are just going to like find a reason to give up. Like they block the folding range, blah, blah, blah. They don't like following through. And there won't be enough other hands over betting turn. Like villains meant to over bet turn sometimes with like just naked gutter, no redraw. Okay, ace, eight, seven. This is a sort of situation where you want to just start with a check with everything. This is not a good board for your range. There are two set making cards here. You want to proceed with some caution. People will bet way, way too often in the spot. So another classic exploit of the micro stakes is just check your range here and do a ton of check raise bluffing, do a ton of check raise value betting, just do a ton of check raising in general. Clearly this is not the candidate hand for that job. Exploit number six, checking out of position on the flop to recreational players in the micro stakes is very good. They bet indiscriminately, they bet way too often, and you can get money in equally well by check raising as you can by betting, even more well where someone's going to play a really bad betting strategy against your check. It's just going to be a check call, but basically our opponent's range is just going to be way too too merged for making that bet. I expect him to bet hands like nines and things like that at too high of a frequency. River, I think block bet is a sensible option. You could check here and hope that they, they bluff, but the queen is just going to eliminate a lot of the air combos from their range by making it second pair, and therefore just blocking for thin value seems like a pretty good idea. Bill and peeling with fives to this bet is very suspect because it's not clear that he actually beats 100% of our bluffs on this node just given how filtered our range has become. So pool will self-destruct, they will just bet when checked to for no reason. It's very important therefore, like I said, to over protect your checking range and just bet a, a range that's a bit weaker. This is going to be a hugely beneficial thing for you to ingrain into your game stop just routinely value betting hands out of position on the flop when you're out of position you can do what you want you can check it over your opponent can bet whenever you can check raise you don't actually have to bet we talk about this a lot in the carrot poker school especially grade 2 lecture 5 which is all about how to master out of position play pretty interesting hand that i didn't record because i'm an absolute buffoon and to pause the recording and, and talk for like five minutes straight but it happens yeah queen's here go for an open jack six four I think this hand is too good to, to do any kind of weird checking business. I think this is just a Queens with a club is a pure C bet here. I think Queens without a club could do some checking. It's just a little bit lower EV in equity. But Queens with a club, we're just going to go ahead and bet. Villain raises this is a really small, bizarre raise size. It kind of indicates that Villain's a recreational player. I expect this range, therefore, to be a bit more mergy than normal. Like It's going to contain more combos of things like Jack X, random 6X. It's like, quote unquote, finding out where it's at. Maybe flush draws, straight draws maybe just nothing sometimes it's just a mixed bag of stuff really easy call anyway turn is the nine of spades and villain makes a catastrophic sizing error here i mean this is just like really irrational poker when you raise the flop you're basically saying that your range is mostly going to be like sets that you want to keep betting here right maybe something like six four suited so why would this size then come into it okay maybe if you've raised some like king jack or something or jack 10 you could like get away with this but why would you bother building like a second bet size just check king jack if you bet it here i think it's really important to just simplify it to like one sizing in this spot and i think what villain's probably just doing here is inadvertently just building this really capped small bet range here that's mostly stuff like flush draws jack x there could be some slow plays in this as well i actually think raising the queens here is an okay play but i think calling is fine too and just seeing what happens on the river Given that we're in position, we don't have to rush the pot growth as much. If I were out of position here and thought I was against this kind of mergy capped range, I'd definitely raise. But I think in position, you can call and just wait. The SBR is already quite big. 
Villain then makes another kind of mergy looking bet on the river. I don't really know what to think of this, but certainly straights are not going to be a, a massive part of their range. They can have 10-8 of clubs, 10-8 of hearts maybe. I'd be very shocked to see any other 10-8s and King-10 is similar. So go for the jam here for value and eventually Villain tanks and then folds. But yeah, interesting spot where I think this pool is just very often not going to know how to size their, their turn bets in particular. Your turn sizing, it's best to simplify to one bet wherever you can, one bet size. And that should really be built completely around your value range. So if you think that you're mainly value betting sets, you want to be betting bigger. If you're value betting like really thin for value with a lot of like denial bets mixed in there, you can bet smaller. But here I don't really think villains should be check raising flop and then betting turn with a lot of stuff for value that's worse than two pair. And therefore a bigger size just makes a lot more sense. We're called four bet here with the Kings. In this situation, you don't actually have to go massive. You have like two uncapped ranges that can still jam on you. I think keeping your sizing somewhat on the small side in this situation is going to be fine. It's going to go 19 bigs. If you think about this from your opponent's points of view, like this is a really grim spot for them anyway, so you don't have to go massive here to achieve fold equity. We're going to call this off. This is going to be aces a lot. It's also going to be queens or ace king or kings sometimes. It's going to be aces a lot though. We're not getting in anything worse than kings in this spot. Kings is literally the worst hand we're going to felt here. It's actually probably close to a fold in, in GTO terms. Because villain should be quite tight there. I don't think it is a fold with kings, but it's probably the only hand other than aces that we felt with there. Things get incredibly tight in that configuration. After that action sequence. Again, the exploit here is opening a hand that's just a kind of break-even play in equilibrium. You have a weaker player in the big blind. This is probably just going to be profitable. Slightly, but still profitable. People also 3-bet a bit less in this pool than they do at higher stakes than, the, the, than a solver would. So, so these hands tend to make money. Like I say, the break isn't really an issue. At this low SBR, I think we can just play call only here. I don't think we actually have to raise anything against this player's large bet. This could be really spewy. It could be all kinds of things. It's likely going to be something, but sometimes it can be something very bad that can't stand a raise. So I think given that there's not much urgency to grow the pot here, we can just start with a call and then just do all the betting ourselves later. Villain checks on the King of Hearts quickly again, very capped range. Unlikely that this is going to be a flush or any kind of thing we need to be wary about. So we just take turn our hand into an absolute value grabber now and just go for, for a few streets of value. The the other exploit here is just that when pool quickly checks, they're not protecting their checking range. I mean, they're not anyway, but when the check is fast, the checking range is even less protected than it would be ordinarily, right? Again, making a close open because we want to, because we feel like it. King Jack 7 rainbow. I bet big on the two-tone variant of this board, on the rainbow variant, I just go small. The idea is that villain's range is less mergy, more polar on the rainbow variant, because they don't have any medium equity hands like flush draws and backdoor flush draws as much. Getting raised here with a pair on the board, you're going to always want to continue here. This is a spot that can get overbluffed if your opponent's a bit overzealous with their gutters. There's a lot of gutters on a board like this. Unfortunately, this turn card is horrific. We're very low down our range now, actually. Ace-Queen just got there. Queen-Nine just got there. I think this is definitely a bluff. Do we bluff it now or later? I'm, I actually think if we just make a slight overbet here and then jam river, I feel like this spot's going to get pretty overfolded by the river. There's some hands that will call turn quickly here, like two pair, there'll be hands like king queen, things like this, but it's really hard for us to have air in this spot, right? And villains cap their range. So I think this jam on the river is going to do very well indeed. Even with two pair here, you know, you might get some folds from someone with like jack seven suited or, or whatever in this spot. You just have so, so many ace queen combos. The, the pattern here is that you have a really strong range with a really weak hand. Whenever you put those two things together, you want to be bluffing. So this is pretty mandatory, I think. Oh, the tension, the drama. Sometimes people know who I am and that's an issue and they make calls that they wouldn't make against pool. So if I do get looked up light here, that doesn't mean that you're that likely to get looked up light here, right? This is something that happens to me more than it happens to a lot of people. Flop trips here, go ahead and make a small c-bet. Hope you enjoyed this micro stakes exploit the video guys. Let me know what you think about it down below in the comments. I'll be sure to get back to you. Final reminder for today that the Carrot Poker School is live. We're selling it on CarrotCorner.com and you can save 500 UK pounds. That's about $627 if my math is correct. Being off the top of my head, let me know if it was at CarrotCorner.com by picking up the full scholarship and getting grade one, grade two and grade three, basically getting your full poker education. This is the part in the video where I have to bid you farewell and say 
Thank you for watching. See you next time. Good luck at the tables and all of that generic stuff. See you soon. Bye bye. Hope you enjoyed the gold footage. More of that to come, I promise. Later, guys.